I'm going to talk to you today about policy. So when you hear the word policy, what sort of pops in your head? What's the immediate reaction? Well, let me give you a couple of clues. I think some people think legislation. You know, and closely related to that, they may think the U.S. Capitol. This is what I would think anyway, because I'm from there, <laughs> Washington, D.C. Um, I think for a lot of people, uh, maybe the cynics out there or anyone who reads the paper, you may think of the word sort of gridlock. That may be the image that pops in your head when you think of policy. That's true. But I think for a lot of people, policy just evokes this kind of very distant world. It's something that is not connected to my world. It's like, you know, you read about some foreign land and, you, you know, it's, it's sad and it's dispiriting, <laughs> but you just put it down and you move on. And I sort of would like to, to make the case to you today that policy can be all of those things, but it's also in many cases a fabulous opportunity to kind of spread and scale your work, including the very interesting things that we just heard, to kind of remove barriers and also to create demand for the products and the innovations that you all have. To sort of structure that, I'd like to talk about four different, answer four different questions. Why is policy an opportunity? Sort of what are we talking about? And I'll use OER, actually, the Open Educational Resources world as a sort of a case example of that. When is it an appropriate thing to sort of think about in, your, in the many tools that you um, possess as you think about scaling your work? And if any of that intrigues you, how would you do it? A couple of practical ideas about kind of moving from idea to action. So let's sort of start with the question of why. Why should you be thinking about policy? And let me give you the top 10 reasons, my argument anyway, about why policy is an opportunity. But I'm kind of a I'm financial person. I'm a budget person. So these are my top 10 reasons, because that's where the money is. <laughs> Unlike a lot of other sectors, uh, education is pretty much dominated by the public sector. It's uh, health care or energy. It makes a lot of sense, perhaps, to work outside of it. In um, the policy world, that's where, that's where the money is. And just l let's take the sector that I'm most engaged with right now, which is philanthropy. So, you know, we spend a lot of money, all collectively, all told, about $5 billion, including the Gates Foundation, which is the leader in our, in our area, which is a lot of money annually. But that's a, less than 1% of the amount of money that's actually spent by the public at large, by either state and local, which is most of that, or the federal government's about $40 billion. If we want to have a shot at kind of sustaining and scaling our work, we have to either cajole, harass, or work to support government in that process. And uh, just sort of one last um, anecdote here before I move on to the next section. If you think that policy and budgets are unrelated, and let me just share something. My first experience, actually, in, when I moved to Washington in 1980. So before I worked in education, my first life, I was actually an EPA budget examiner at the Office of Management and Budget. And so I started there in the summer of 1980. I was, it's a civil service job. And by the fall of that year, I was super surprised to find that Ronald Reagan actually took office. For some reason, that surprised me at that time. But he did. And so our world changed a lot. I mean, he ran on a platform kind of uh, very anti-regulatory. He wanted to really shift um, kind of the burden on business. And so what they actually did is in the first few years, you won't remember this, you're too young, but there was a sort of real frontal assault, legislative assault on the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the kind of main acts that undergird environmental regulation. And that actually turned out to be very unsuccessful. That did not work. People really didn't want to change these things frontally. So instead, they switched somewhere in there to a budget <laughs> conversation and actually ended up reducing, by the time I left, the request from the, gov from the uh, Office of Management and Budget to the Hill for the EPA budget was half the level it had been when, it when we started. And what does that do? If you don't have money, you cannot do enforcement actions, you cannot do permitting, you cannot inspect anything. So you can actually get to your goal of deregulation simply by defunding the, the, the primary agency. That's why these things are highly related. Budget, policy are, are pretty much the same thing, I would argue. So let's sort of move to the what. 
And I'll give it a case example of um, open educational resources. How many people here are familiar with OER? Open education, look, most people are familiar with the term or have seen it. It's uh, basically, for those who are not, it refers to the kind of a licensing structure that enables high quality educational assets to be tailored for personal use or for, for any use by individuals. So that's kind of one des description of it. And Mike Smith, who's out here somewhere, my predecessor, I think had a huge amount to do with really creating and fostering this movement. ISKME is a leader here, and there's an open strand, which I'm hoping you'll get to. But OER is um, kind of beyond that technical definition, is things like the MIT Open Courseware Initiative that hopefully many of you have seen. It's Sal Khan's work. It's a $5 textbook in, in Utah that is actually um, as good as its much more expensive counterpart. That's what OER is. And so when I got to Hewlett about three years ago, kind of a couple things happened that I'm pretty convinced had nothing to do with me, but they, they happened around the time that I started. Uh, one thing that happened was that the stock market crashed in October of 2008. Um, it, wor it was the worst market cr uh, correction since the Great Depression. So that was a very bad time and a very bad year. Um, the second thing that happened that had nothing to do with me <laughs> is that President Obama was inaugurated. So there was a challenge and an opportunity. What were they? The challenge is that when the stock market crashed and that year of volatility led to a significant reduction actually in our own endowment. And it, this occurred across the country with a lot of other philanthropies, but we ended up with a grant making level which was about, which, which was its lowest level in 10 years. So we had that with this great, vibrant OER movement, much less money to be able to spend on it. And uh, in terms of the Obama administration, they had run on a platform of open government, and they had some fantastic champions who really understood what OER and what openness can do to transform education. And you heard from one of them last night, Martha Cantor. So there were sort of the policy framework and a, and a set of people who actually really understood this. The second thing that happened, I think, with the administration is they released the economic stimulus. They signed into that into law about three weeks after uh, the president took office. That, that actually carried with it $100 billion for education. That was the largest investment, single investment, in education in the history of, of education. So that was a huge challenge and a huge opportunity. So what did we do to try to capitalize on that? We pulled together these four organizations. These are some of the most influential organizations in the, in the field in DC. The chief state school officers that you probably know. INACOL is a, a group that focuses on online education. They're sort of one of the best advocacy groups on that. CETA, the state education technology directors. This is a lot of where the innovations have come from, from the state ed tech directors. And Ed Council is a law firm in DC that really specializes on education policy issues. So what did they do? Well, they did a lot of things. They sort of identified where opportunities might be to, to move OER along. They developed an awareness campaign. They made sure that OER was talked about every time there were state conferences coming up. They pulled together the community, sort of relatively disparate community of OER supporters, you know, through Google groups and webinars and so forth. And so they kind of organized the constituency. And here are some of the results that they, along with these really terrific inside champions, were able to achieve. These are the set of initiatives that all have some component of openness in them now, initiatives and also plans. You know, I'll point out one in particular, the Trade Adjustment Assistant Act, very dry name, but that provided $2 billion for community colleges, all of which must carry, if they're producing educational materials, a Creative Commons license, an open license. That's a huge, huge win for the OER community. And they also included, again, OER in a set of grant programs as preferences. So I think that was a big um, kind of promising development. And at the state level, there are a set of states that are now moving more aggressively ahead in the OER world. But um, you know, policies 
can be your best friend, in, you know, like your BFF in high school, and it can be a terrible friend. And um, so we've also, I think, here picked up, OER's picked up, because whenever you're rocking the boat, you're rocking something, right? So somebody else is gonna react to that. Um, something called an appropriation rider. That's a very inside DC, inside the beltway term. What it means is that like those little cars of legislation that are moving along the lanes, it's picked up something in the back seat that would actually prohibit um, or could actually potentially damage this OER provision that, was, that I just talked about in the, in the Trade Adjust Adjustment Assistance Act. So this often happens that um, something is moving along on one side and then something is moving along to stop it somewhere else. So uh, all of that is to say that you've got to kind of keep your eye on that ball as well. So let's sort of move to the when. When is policy a good thing that you should be really thinking about as you're considering all the opportunities available to you? It's, it's difficult to do, but under what circumstances should this is an appropriate response? Well, the first thing is that you really have to have clarity about what you're trying to do. That seems obvious, but I found, you know, when I was in the government and also in philanthropy right now, that's harder to do than you'd think. So you've got to be clear about what you're trying to do. For example, in OER, to define it, define what open educational resources are. I think we've got consensus around that, but that was a process. So that's sort of number one. Be really clear about what you're trying to do. Second, you've got to um, provide evidence of success, of impact. And again, this is something that very frequently, I think, I would hear people would come in and they'd say, you know, I'm doing that right now. We've got a, a nice study going on and we'll have the results in a couple of years. It's pretty hard to make that case, I think, to policymakers unless you have something in hand. So having some evidence that you've had a positive impact on student outcomes is pretty key. Whatever you're doing needs to be scalable and replicable. It needs to work not just in one small area, in one district, in one school. It's great if you can actually show that it works in urban settings and rural settings and in a variety of settings, especially if you're appealing to somebody at a national level. And you need a passionate, committed organization that's really gonna carry the ball on this. And that moves into um, sort of the last section, which is really the how. So if this seems interesting, what are some ways that you could actually move, move ahead? You need to, not only that passion and organization, it's best if that's actually embedded within a broad-based coalition. The more diverse the coalition, the better. In, in my time in DC, when the, when the police officers and the after-school people got together and advocated for more funding for after-school, that was a great combination, surprising one, and that worked well. You need to find the right person to lead it. These coalitions are tricky. You've got a lot of different interests that you're engaging at the same time. That's critical. You need to really know what, again, you're asking for. Is it money? Are you trying to get, you know, remove barriers? What is it that you're trying to do? And what will happen as a result of that ask? You need to find an inside champion. What do I mean by that? You, you need to find a policymaker inside government who has influence over the decisions that you're, that you're asking to change. That's critical. Everything you need to do, it continues on the sort of evidence theme, support that with data. There will be opposition. If you're doing anything substantial, it will be controversial and somebody will oppose that. So you anticipate that, expect that, work to minimize that, overcome that. And last thing, you just gotta stay with it. It's a very nonlinear process. There's sort of, you make forward progress and, and backward progress, and over a kind of a long period of time, you just gotta sort of, if you decide to do this, you really do need to stick with it for a substantial period of time, maybe 10 years, you know, kind of following, following the entire kind of length of it. Thank you.